Hey firecrackers, it's Naomi and welcome to the firecracker department. How's everybody doing? Boy, I am loving, I am loving the firecracker art department that is just bursting with cool, creative, inspiring pieces that you're doing over on Instagram. Go on over to hashtag firecrackerartdept and see what people are creating. I have to say, I'm spending so much time on Zoom, I'm sure you are too, it's a lot of screen time, that on the weekend, I shut her down. I do only Zoom with my family. I don't do meetings. I don't do like any kind of classes or workshops. I'm just like offline as much as I can. And I started doing some art. And my good friend Jane Eastwood, gosh, I love Jane Eastwood, suggested I do some collaging. Jane was one of my past episode guests that you have to go listen to. In fact, just pause this right now. Go back, listen to her episode because she's just an amazing, amazing person. A Second City alum. Oh my gosh, she's such a creative person artist in so many different ways and one of the funniest people I've ever met. But she suggested I do some collaging. So I've been making these collages and I love it. It's taking me off my computer and getting me active creatively in a different way. I'd love to know what you're creating. Are you doing everything on the computer? Is that driving you nuts? What are you doing to get yourself off the computer and into some other creative zone? Share it with me at firecracker D-E-P-T or throw it in an email firecrackerdepartment at gmail.com. Love to hear from you. Now we are continuing the podcast at home this week and I am so excited for this guest because she's been on my list forever. I honestly, I think even when we started the show, I was like, I gotta get this gal on this show. And then our schedules didn't work out and uh, I kept missing her. And then things all came together when I got to interview my buddy, Aaron Carpluck. Yes, she's the best. I met this amazing person on the set of the series Being Erica, where she was being Erica. Yeah, she's been on your TV in Slasher, in Rookie Blue, Masters of Sex, Saving Hope, and a ton of other shows. She's on the show Holly Hobby right now. Uh, she's just an amazing person. She's just one of those people, again, like you sit down with her or you like I'll see her at an event or I'll see her in passing and I just think she's so full of light and intelligence and comedy and joy and she's driven. I love being around people that are driven but aware of the world around them. Do you know what I mean? Like there's people that are driven but they don't know what's happening around them but erin has got like a really great perspective and balance about the whole thing and it sure is inspiring to be around. We talk about what she's been doing in 2020. We talk about vision boards. We talk about having faith in yourself, being raised by artists, uh, giving yourself pep talks. Boy, that's a good one. If anybody's got a good pep talk that they give themselves, please post it at Firecracker DPT because everybody could use more pep talks. Um, I wish we could have had this conversation in person because, well, A, I would have brought snacks. There's always snacks that I bring for all these meetings, whether it's strawberries, I try not to bring like crunchy snacks because that's not going to work, but I do try to bring something fun. Either way, we're just so lucky to live in a time where we have the ability to connect in so many other ways and uh, sure felt good to connect with Erin today. Okay, here she is, the one and only Erin Karplak. It's so nice to spend some time with you. I know. Yeah. What's been for you? What's the, been the biggest pivot for you this last? I think I, just on the norm with everyone of how to have a functional lifestyle with and also keeping responsible by staying indoors and with and 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 trying to say is this enough like there's so much that I'd, I'd love to do out there but then really being like you're not a hero and you what the best thing to do is just stay the fuck out of there. <laughs> like, okay, what can I do pivot pivot here and so I'm really trying to um not to sound super corny, but like did a vision board workshop. And I'm like, it's one of those things that, you know, now that I had the time and it's really helped set in for me clarity of like different balance and how I want to uh, be as mentally healthy as I can, physically healthy, spiritually, like spirit, spirituality right now is huge. And I'm not talking religion. I'm just talking about like having faith and, and, um, you know, taking care of yourself in a balanced, every form of way so you can be the best you so that you can be the best person you can for other people and so on and so forth. So it's kind of an interesting shift in the world. 
um, that I mean, were- not to, don't belittle that stuff, Erin. Like, I think that's huge. Did you, did you teach the class or did you take the vision board class? Oh, good God. I should never teach the class. No, it was, uh, it's from this, my friend from Calgary sent me this link. It's Mommies and Me Australia, something, something. And her name is Lauren Love. And she works with Tony Robbins and it's an hour. It's like an, just over an hour. It's online. If you just punch in her name, Lauren Love, uh, it's a global vision workshop. And I used to just think, you know, just slap on some stuff that inspires you, but it really like, she has it segregated out into nine different quadrants. Oh, so it's like, it's intense and really setting goals and focus. And it's really like challenged me. I listened to your podcast yesterday with Amanda crew and you asked, you know, what are your career aspirations? And I was like, what the hell are my career aspirations? Like I've been doing what I'm doing, but then also to really kind of like hone in, I, I realized that that's one of my weakest quadrants of like just getting and, and asking the big questions. And also as we're spending all this time alone, a lot of shit comes up like, and just to have to deal with it. And everyone's indifferent, not to kind of get all scattered, but everyone is in I'm with you. situations. I mean, there's, there's the people that are working and they're grateful to be working, but they're having to put themselves and their loved ones at risk every day by going out there. There's people that are grateful not to be working because they're home, but then they're not getting the income and they don't know how they're going to pay their bills. There's the people like myself that are alone. I have cats, but like, so there's days where I'm a bit like, a bit tired of me, myself and I, but then I'm able to do these vision boards where my friends that are working and have no child support and two kids are like, fuck you and your vision board. <laughs> you know, and then couples that are cute, like, like wanting to kill each other and then, you know, big households. It's, or, but we have to be grateful that we have a roof over our head and I do have this time to work on things and, and just to plow through. And I just find it's so important to have a daily routine and that's kind of how we started. Like, and yeah. so I have that thing every day. Um, most days have been really, really good here, but yesterday I just had one of those days of like, it's slumpy is she slumpy and you can't fight it and you can't say, well, I did my workout, so I should feel better. And I'm going to call some people and I'm going to get my taxes. And did, you know, I just, the whole day I was like, no matter what I did, meditate, light the candles, I did my nails for you yeah. <laughs> and for me. And, and, you know, I just felt like this kind of sense of blah. And I was like, okay, it's just a blah. Yeah. And you know, I jumped out of bed this morning and grabbed my coffee and I was excited to talk to you, but just like keeping that routine. And at least yesterday I can say, you know what, I accomplished certain things. And then at one point I just kind of surrendered and I, but I think that what you're talking about is looking after the first circle to me, like the first week of quarantine, I was sick. So like everything else had to fall apart. I had to be like, get into bed, get better, get healthy. And then you can look after the next person and then you can look after your neighbors and then you can look after the world. But when I'm sick, I gotta, like, I lock, gotta lock in, right? Absolutely. So what you're talking about, like, spiritual health is huge, I think. It's huge. It's yeah. huge. Kind of a cool shift for the world to have to really go inside. And, you know, they say, it's this one quote my cousin sent me, and she's like, you know, as the world is apart, we all come together. And in some sense, it's just, we've never gone through this before, and everyone has touched everyone all over the world. So. Yeah. And the luxury of like, you're saying when Amanda was talking about like, what do I want for my career? Like, that's such a place of luxury now. Yes. Right. Yeah. Like it really has like boiled down what's important and like our family and looking after each other. And that's important. Mm -hmm. But then also your creative, like, I think your creative soul is so important because if that starts to dwindle, I don't know, I start to feel real grumpy and then I'm no good to anybody. Mm -hmm. And then I have nothing to give. Yeah, totally. So I'm all about the vision board. I think that's really awesome. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I love my friends. It was actually Amanda's friend, Amber. They did Granny Girls. And I was like, guys, there's a great link. And Amber was like, bah! I should deal with the kids. And I was like, fair enough. Yeah, because you're on your own in your apartment, right? Your condo? Yeah. Because yeah. we were talking yes the other day about like um, missing touch, missing hugging people. Like I just, we're in an apartment, so we see people. And you're here, and then, yeah, yeah, we're in Los Angeles, but we see, like, I just saw my neighbor because one of the neighbors said there's muffins downstairs. I made muffins and I put them in the lobby because we have just the best apartment. So we were all like racing down to the lobby to get these freshly baked muffins. And we saw each other on the stairs and I felt like just like the celebration of the muffins. I just wanted to give her a big hug and no, nope, didn't. Kept walking. No, I know, I know. 
from six feet away, you're like, I love you. Thank you. I also think that like, it's so interesting because your brain, I think your brain must be similar to mine in the sense of like, you were brought up by non classical artists at right? all. Yeah. Right. Like your mom was a principal and your dad worked for the railroad, right? Everyone in my family works the railroad and my mom was the high school principal and that's, yeah. Which has its art. Like, you know, my father's a chemistry professor and when he builds a molecule, he, he's like, that's art, which I get, I believe in. Everybody's an artist, but you weren't came, coming from a place of like, go, go towards the stage, go towards no. the camera. No, if, if, if anything, it was the opposite, you know, like I remember my mom said, you know, honey, when I was growing up, you were either a nurse or a teacher. Like, there, right. there's, you know, so when I said, I want to be an actor. And my mom what said, did they say? Well, yeah. I, she said, what? And I said, well, someone's got to do it. And I just, you know, I had that silent secret dream ever since I was a little, a little kid. And then when I, I was accepted to you, Vic, as a theater major, and we don't have, we didn't have acting in Jasper at all. And, and uh, so, you know, I was going in for a BFA like a Bachelor of Fine Arts, and my mother was like, you know what we call a BFA? And I won't repeat what it stands for. Oh, today. big. A big. Bachelor of two to all degree, of F all degree. Yeah, F all. Um, <laughs> that now. But, uh, you know, so I, I went and did it for four years and came out, and I think it was at the point where I, I you know, started making an income and doing things. They were like, okay, okay, they just want what's best for you. But it of is course. outside the norm of, of how I was raised. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So did, so how did, like, to me, that is, um, you have to go through certain barriers then. Right. So when you're like, I'm going to go become an actor, they're like, all right. Yeah. You like, go, do go do your rug hooking. And <laughs> <laughs> like, it's such a hobby, right. It's such a, in a lot of people's minds. So where did you find like your, I don't know, your get up and go -ness, like your ability to not necessarily need the support of your parents because they probably didn't have it. No judgment on them, but just they didn't know. Right. So where did you find that kind of cheerleading? Honestly, the one thing I will say about myself, there's many things I'm working on, but the one thing I always knew, and it's like your path, and, I'm, and there's people in their 40s that still don't know what they want to do, and I'm just very grateful that I always knew this. Like it was Always. Thing. And like, I was very headstrong. I said, you know, I want a television in my room. And my parents laughed. And so I went out the next day, I got a paper route. I worked for four months throughout the winter, dragging papers through the snow. I made $400. I went to home hardware. I bought a TV. I brought it home on this bike. I set it up and I sat in my room for a year and watched TV. My parents were like, okay, okay. She's, and then I wanted to join hockey. And they said, no, you have to join figure skating. And if you do figure skating for a year, then you can do hockey. So I did the whole year of figure skating, little little kid with like you know what I mean like can skate I think they called it and yeah so we did the carnival and all the boys were bumblebees and I had a big flower daisy on my head and we finished and my dad gave me my first rose and he said so did you like it and I said I want to join hockey <laughs> and then when it came to the acting thing I remember being like I'm gonna go do this and they were like uh and all my friends within Jasper it's, it's quite remote number to go to you know Calgary or Edmonton and I just remember I saw a picture of you Vic it looked sounded cool it looked cool and I was like no I'm going there I was 17 just went and I rolled into my first day of I mean acting classes and everybody was their star their high school plays and I literally not acted a day in my life and we had to do monologues I didn't know what a monologue was so I wrote a whole play where I had rugby players from my dormitory coming in through the catwalks and it was Bonnie and Clyde and I was yeah. dying Clyde, Clyde I'm dying and I had ketchup packs squirting out and like no teacher was like it's a monologue Aaron like it's one and I had no idea and I had this massive elaborate thing anyways they passed me through to second year just because I guess I, I really really wanted it but um but I guess that drive of just it's and and, and you know I'm 41 now and I can honestly say my earliest memory of wanting to be an actor was maybe being five years old. And it's the one thing that I've never swayed from, deterred from. It's scary. It's, there's no stability in our job. We don't get a pension. You know, you, I mean, we've worked together. You know the industry and how difficult it is, particularly you being a comedian, which I give you such kudos for. But like it's, it's and, and getting older and facing adversity and being in L.A all the competition but it's I still just have there's no plan b and yeah. I just have and you never wavered like you never even went 
All right, I gotta look into nursing school. No. <laughs> That's amazing. No. I mean, and I even, think I think yeah. there's like I have the same sort of vision, but at the same time I was always like I remember a time that I thought, oh my God, I've made a huge mistake and I better go to like teacher's college or something like that. And then I looked at all the books that I'd bought, all the plays, and I'm like, I can't. I've I've just invested too much in books. What am I gonna do with all these plays? So I yeah. Can't. Yeah. yeah. But did yeah. you ever have like a tipping point where you like, I mean, I'm sure you have had this where you went, oh no, it's going to be okay. I did. I, I remember there's certain things that I've learned throughout the years. And I always like when I'm on, on top and feeling like I'm never more happy other than Christmas morning when I'm on set, even if it's a shitty movie and I'm playing a dumb part, there's one thing and there, there'll be a point in the day where I'll look around at uh you know the crew and his family you have it i just feel like it's magic i feel like i'm like oh my god is if i'm i mean is if i'm doing this for 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 a living and i i just like every day my very first job i was at university and uh they did an open call on this show called seven days and they had three bus girls from the class go and audition for it and like i was fully kabuki like (laughs) oh no no go. And I think it was Sid Kozak was casting at the time. And he's like, let's oh just read it down a tick and just say the lines. And then I ended up getting it. I ended up driving my little Honda Accord to a Squimal, to a naval yep. ship. And I remember, you know, I was, I arrived late. We didn't have cell phones. And I said, hey, I'm playing someone's wife. And they said, oh, your background, go background holding. And so I was in there with all my buddies and we're drinking coffee and it was freezing in this warehouse. And, you know, an hour had passed and they said, okay, everybody, this is your job. Do not talk. You know, you don't, don't speak on camera. You don't. And I remember saying, oh, excuse me. I have a, I have a line, a couple lines that I say. And they're like, oh my God, are you Aaron? Cause obviously it was an hour late at this point. So then I was like, <laughs> and they invited my buddies and they shipped me off to hair and makeup. And I got my hair and makeup done and I had a trailer and I had clothes. And then I, you know, met the, this gorgeous man playing my husband and I was really short and I'm still short. And they had to build a little bridge for me to like walk next to him so they could get the grandiose master shot of all the naval ships in the back. And it was just, you know, and then my little buddies from background where they had their coffee and I was like, Hey guys, and I had this, I, you know, I was like, that part of it is not very fair. But I remember anyways, sitting in my Honda court at the end of the day. And I think I got paid $600. I didn't have an agent and I just grabbed the steering wheel and I said, I am doing this for the rest of my life. Like it was written in stone and 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 so just to go back finally to your your question there's when I'm on top like anytime I'm on set I just because I've been through the lows too months and months of not working just being like it will be okay it'll get better it'll be okay just hang in there so when I'm down in the dumps or I lose a part or I you know financially stressed or whatever I'm like it will get better because re- I remember you told yourself when you were up there that it will be okay and it always works out it really really it has for me and I think of that faith is huge and so just that pep talk works for you just the pep talk of like it's gonna be okay yeah and That's- if you have a meltdown my manager's really cool she's like oh pickle it's gonna be fine there'll be something coming down like if you need to rely on that but but uh I I do I do not to sound woo woo but I do believe that the universe has your back and and if you keep showing up and keep doing the work it'll it, it'll be it will be there it just where did be. you where did you get that from that kind of work ethics or self belief i think my mother was a huge player in that she they were both my parents were very like from the generation saskatchewan work hard like work hard be a good person work hard so I, I think that that's just one thing that it's just been like, you know, work hard, work hard. And, and honestly, Naomi, it's just that again, this path, this draw, I just blindly trust it. Yeah. I, I just am like, okay, one foot in front of the other, every self tape at a time, every new meeting at a time. And I think the biggest challenge for me is not persisting in it, but to keep finding the love and the joy when I'm not shooting. Because mm-hmm. when I'm shooting, it's great. then all the other shit in the business of like the auditioning part and the networking and the you know red carpets and all that stuff are fine but it's a lot of work I mean there's tons of facets to us as actors and my favorite one is just being on set I'm like action that's where I want to live but there's that's you know I mean that's five percent of the time 
So yeah, how do you monitor all that other stuff, like the the red carpet? And because it's so often like the outward on us as opposed to the inward that we're we're craving, right? We're craving the time on set when you're like delving into a character. And then, I mean, I don't know what percentage is, but it's not high because then suddenly it's turned back and it's interviews and it's red carpety. How do you balance that? Um, I, uh, thankfully the projects that I've had to promote, I've loved and love being a part of them. And if I don't, I just focus on people or certain elements and just uh, to, uh, to focus on and keep it positive and to keep it fun. Like it's not, uh, to consciously embrace those, like even auditions, it's not my favorite. It's not my favorite. People are like, why do you still have to audition? And I was like, are you kidding me? Yeah. Like, Yes, like you for the rest of our lives. Lead on a series. I was like, Rachel McAdams still has to audition for things. Like, come on, people. So, so for me, auditioning, I, I, I really, I love self taping because you have a lot more control over it, and it's, and I, I do like to have control. It's very hard for me to let go of control unless I'm in the work and I've done the prep and that and can be there. But so I just consciously said, okay, I'm gonna. How do I love auditions? And for me, it's about being mad prepared, like crazy prepared. Um, and, uh, and, and mental tricks. This is just specifically like one element of, of being like, you know what, I want to make this really fun for the casting directors. Cause then it makes it less about me and more about them. Oh, that's so I'm, smart. It, and so I'm like, I'm going to, and to it, like, I try to remember the casting director's eyes when I go in there to be like, I, and I'll write it down on my phone after I just met Joe Blow today with so-and-so casting. He had, he had, uh, this, these really cool frames on and like crystal blue eyes and before I do something, I just, whoever the reader is, I just really try to connect with them and be like, I'm going to show them a good time. I have to tell you that just turn, I mean, not to get woo woo on you, but that turned a light on because that's such an improv thing to say, which is others focused, right? Like when you're in an improv show, it's important to be others focused because then you're not so self-absorbed that you're like concerned about every move, every word. You're worried about the other person having a good time. But I don't put that into play in auditions. I'm more like, don't screw it up, sneakers, which is an <laughs> awful mantra to have going into a, an audition. Oh, I've been there too. And I think the majority, like you have those, like those, those experiences where you're like out of body and you're yeah. looking at yourself. Oh, and you're, fuck. Yeah. Perfect. You're shitting the bed right now. You know these lines. And then you're like, oh, but that girl in the, the girl in the waiting room, she was on that television show and she's so pretty and she was so friendly and they're going to totally want her. They're just going to offer it to her. And, and like, you know, like, sure, shit the bed done that but just like consciously trying to go in to these parts of the job that I don't like and and I think a lot of it has to do with the content of what you're doing if I have to go in and spew off uh, oh. like a myriad of lawyer science fiction or medical jargon oh. that it's stressful because it's yeah. just kind of like can you like diarrhea out these lines in a way that makes sense but if I'm going and doing something like attuned to being Erica or real life stuff or like banter or like comedy yeah can actually really like I love those auditions where I go to and I'm like oh I got like I can just go in there and have fun and just show them your little piece of the pie on it take the direction and get the hell out yeah uh, it's like when this cast and directors can say like just have fun with that and you're like you have fun with that this isn't like science oh, speak oh, isn't fun yeah. <laughs> unless you're a scientist and then I'm sure it's a just a riot <laughs> but yeah I have to say like when we so we met on your show being Erica and I have to tell you two things that have stuck with me Forever, and this was three thousand years ago. Three thousand. Yeah. <laughs> we look really good. We look really good for three thousand years. But I remember coming to set, and I was super nervous. We were doing the web series. I think I did one of the episodes as like a special thing. But we did the web series. Came on set. You knew everybody's name. You were like so grounded on your set. I was like, oh, she must also be producing this. Like this was also because you just had this comfort and security. Somebody said, um, you, somebody said, oh yeah, let's take it. Let's uh, take a break. And you said, I remember you said, you know what? I'm a, I'm a real fan of going back to my trailer. And I went, that's such a smart idea. Cause you're looking after yourself. You looked after your, like the energy that you had for the day. Cause you probably had like a 18 hour day. So you knew everybody's name, you knew how to like land yourself. And then also you had like maybe 20 pages to memorize overnight or something like that. Like people were astounded with your work ethics as well. So like all the things you're saying, I'm saying like you actually live what you're saying because I've seen it. Ah, that's so sweet. Thank you. Um, you love your job. 
I love my job. And it's funny because like in areas like not even a pandemic and quarantine can get me to sit down and do my taxes. No. And like, like literally in my head, as soon as my brother and I, we have a property that we're discussing what we're going to do with it. And the second he starts talking, there's like this fair Ferris wheel, Ferris wheel. Yeah. Like, he starts like going around and everything tunes out. Like I have no, it's just not in my jurisdiction in my wheelhouse, but then get me on set. And like, yeah. I am, I'm so efficient. And I, and I do make a point of, even before I go on to a show, I'll ask for the cruise sheet early. Cause I like to be able to like, Hey, Ryan, a camera, nice to meet you, blah, blah, blah. So you're not, I mean, if it's one day, it's tricky to get everyone's names, but if I know I'm going to be on for a bit, it just adds that personal touch and being able to say, you know, Hey, Joe, who's doing props, Joe, do you have a, a cell phone I could use for scene five? A? I I was just thinking, blah, blah, blah. Like I just, it just, for me, the onset experience, cause for every hour of television we produce, there's seven days of your life on set. And if you can't have fun with those people, particularly if you're on a series, mm -hmm. series reg, there's no point. What like, are we doing? What are we doing? Yeah. Like, have fun. It's not, I mean, we're not, we're, we're really not saving lives. Let's, we're providing a lot, I will say, but let's, let's try to have fun doing it. So, um, but sometimes it's not up to you. Like when well, you're the lead, so like when you're number one, then it's your party. You can set the tone. And that's why I've always like Reagan, who was also on the show. So fun. Oh, hey, Kirby, Kirby, Kirby. Oh, I hate it. I would hate to be the lead. I don't, I, I just really like. I like if you know Reagan, this is how she talks. <laughs> so I just go in for like you know three days and an episode and do my thing, and that's good. Like that, that, that's good. I don't want to be there the whole thing. And so we're so different because I feel so much less pressure when I'm number one or number two, and I'm given the responsibility of like telling the story. I feel in my element because because I, I I I go left and everyone pivots with me. I go right, everyone's there supportive, and it's like oh my god and having the freedom to tell a story. Whereas I get extremely nervous going onto someone else's show mm -hmm. or like I was on Rookie Blue or Saving Hope or, you know, where the, the cast has been together for years, jamming and doing this stuff. And then I went to the, to the table read and there's like 40 people there and the execs and everyone is staring at you. And I was like, I don't want to fuck this up. Like I didn't, you know, I'm, I, I just want to be so supportive and do my job. I find it very stressful going onto other people's show. Whereas if it's yours, it's like, it's your party. Uh, it's your party. And yeah. you were so good. To this day, my mother's like, well, being Erica, I just have to say those webisodes, they were so funny. They were, and, and I couldn't remember if your character was on the show before or after we did the webisodes, but it was before, right? We did the webisodes. And then I think I did like one or two as a flashback to your old life. Okay. I think. But Jesse Gabe wrote those. I remember, and Ron Murphy directed them. And it was just like the meeting of the funnest minds. It was so fun and you did all the work because I literally just had to play a straight man. And you're like, you're really brilliant. You're so really, fun. really- Oh, really thanks. Well- Going around and like creating this whole other like dimension to her life. And they were there anyways. But I'm, again, that's like, the, that's like the play pals, right? Like if you come to set and you meet the person and they're like, they give you like the don't talk to me energy. But then if you meet a person like you and then you're like, hey, let's have some fun. Then you're like, oh, this is going to be fun. You know what I mean? Like I've been on set before where I'm like, oh, why can't this be fun? Why does it have to be so stressful? And that leads from number one and DOPs and everybody. Like if everybody's having a good time, then it's going to be a good result. It's huge. It's everything. Did you find, so how is the, the transition then after being Erica? What was that like? Because I also remember that you got your green card during like I was there the day that you were like, I drove to Montreal and they yeah. asked you to sign an autograph and you're like, whatever, take it, whatever you want. So I think you were moving the next year to the I States. always had it set where we, we wrapped in 2011 in September. I went to China with my mother and then I moved to LA because I always thought, okay, the show's done. This is the natural progression. I've worked for two years to get my green card and I'm going to go to LA. And I love that when you and Amanda were talking how, you know, you just show up and you, I think you said like, oh, great. I'm going to do a little, little goal setting here. I would yeah. like to have done two jobs by October. And then you get here and you're like, oh shit. No, that's not how it works. That was my vision board. That was my, <laughs> so when we arrived, I'm like, I'm going to really like put it out there universe. Hear me. I want this. I want that. And then I kept looking at the vision board and eventually I just put it away. Cause I was like, oh, sneakers. 
<laughs> make your goals more realistic. I don't know. What we was it like for you? Survived. We're here. No, I mean, I didn't expect them to roll out the red carpet, but I, I don't know. It's tough. It's a tough city. It is. I, I, I mentally was like, okay, you know, big fish in a little pond and then going into something different. And I really, I tried, I thought that I mentally prepped. And I was also coming off a high of being like on this great show for four years and had new representation. And I packed up my little Honda and I drove the two days down and I ended up buying the place that I'm in now. And I, I remember I moved in and I was like, okay, okay, I'm here. And it was all fine and dandy when I used to do pilot seasons. Cause you come down and there was a beginning, a middle and an end. And you were there for one thing and it was business orientated, but to move my entire life down here, I didn't, I can honestly say that the first year I was, it's the first time I've experienced depression Yeah, because I didn't mentally prepare for the fact that this, this isn't just like a short thing. Like I, so that's where the balance comes in. It's like, I came here for my career, but like I moved into this place. I didn't have garbage can. I didn't have bed. I didn't have TV. I didn't have friends. I didn't have anything. So I, I think a year after me being here, I was, I found myself very, very slumpy and I had to like really reevaluate. Actually it was around when I was third. I remember it was my 35th birthday and said, okay, you're unhappy. What needs to change? And so I, I got into online dating, which I thought was taboo. I started saying yes to things. I joined a triathlon club for God's sakes. I took acting classes. You know, I really kind of branched out. I, I, and a huge thing was, and this is back to Reagan, is getting, I got rescue animals. And they, yeah. I just, I, I've now, you know, here I am, it's 10 years I've been here and it's a home. It's a home. I have community. Community, community. In your is everything. And everything. I love it. I'm not here now. Like it's, it, it's shocking every time I go in, I'm like, you guys live here? There's like, there's a big community of us here. Yeah. Very- it's why we stayed like in this, in this crazy time in the world. I was like, our community's here. Like we're in a build and even like when Matt and I first got here and we were doing shows and you folks came to the IO and would come and see our shows. I'm like, Oh, my people. And it's going to be okay. Cause my people are here. Like if, and so easily in Los Angeles, it's easy to lock down yeah. and be like, I'm not going to go outside cause I can't afford to, or I don't want to meet anybody in here that they're working and I'm not. So you sort of lock down and then you're effed. Yes. Like I actually think of uh, my biggest suggestion for people moving here is invest in your community from the first step, like enroll in classes, do like a triathlon, whatever you have to do. That's so smart. Where were you when I first moved here? Cause, cause, I mean, I was in still in Toronto, dude. Because <laughs> <That's like, laughs> it's everything. Like if I would have known that. Anyways, it was, a, it, was a, it was a lesson that I had to learn and a time that I had to go through, but you're hundred percent right. And I will share that with people that are coming like, get out there. And also, I think you're, you're probably good at this too. When people first move here, reaching out and being like, Oh yeah, like this yoga studio is great. And this acting class is great. And we go for hikes on, on Saturdays to prime and come and meet some, yeah. you know what I mean? And, and, and then from there, like, and it, it blows my mind that Los Angeles is the fourth largest Canadian city. Did you say Popul- fourth largest Canadian city? Yeah. There's for population. Oh, population. okay. <laughs> Sorry. So it's, it's not a Canadian city, obviously. Yeah. But no, but some people say, call it Little Canada. Like, I think because it has such a Canadian feel to it, the, the community-wise. Yeah. It's, Toronto has, obviously, the largest city of Canadians. And then Vancouver, Montreal. And then Los Angeles has more Canadians living in it than, like, Calgary, Edmonton. That's so interesting. China, Ottawa. Yeah. There's so did of- you, like, when you got out of your slump then, and, like, did you also find it challenging to get back on set and being like, my people, but you're not there every day. Like in being Erica, was that a hard transition? You mean going on to a show where I'm not the lead or going into something specifically American? Um, well, when you're not like, it's not your party anymore. Because uh, like, there's such a beautiful, like I know when I, when I like on Mr. D, like the joy was seeing those crew people every day and being able to be like, how's this thing going that we talked about on a break? And I love that so much. And so when it's just a day or two, I'm like the, uh, I feel like I'm like the new girl in school and be like, Hey, Hey guys, like trying to get to know people. And they're like, you're gone in two days, sucker. Get out of here. So. You're a swipper. Start work, finish. You know how it says. Yeah, exactly. I'm not investing in you. Yeah. I just did. I just did a couple things on uh there's a television show called 911 and then they have a 911 Lone Star with Rob Lowe and then the other one has Angela Bassett and they crossed over my characters so it was fun. I was like yay like working in LA it's always something to celebrate but I was a Swiffer on both shows start work finish 
And so, like, I'm not going to go up to Angela Bassett and be like, hey, did it. Like, I didn't even ask her for a picture or anything, even though I was totally starstruck. Uh, but, like, I know, I think at this point, 20 years in, I know my job. Like, when I go on to those things, these guys are tired. They're working long days. My job as a guest star is to go on, blow it out of the water. They're going to work me to the bone on that day. And I'm going to give my best. And I'm going to be pleasant and polite and do good work and get the hell out. And that's, that's, that's my rule. At least I feel that way when I'm doing a guest star. Uh, recurring is a bit more fun because then you do get that camaraderie with like the camera guy. And you're like, hey, can I see a picture of your daughter from her birthday? And yeah. Da, 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 and yeah, uh, I'm buying like crew gifts, yes. and they'd be like, "You were here for two days. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I've got everybody's name memorized. Here's muffins with your name on it." <laughs> I have gotten better at saying uh, leaving shows because I used to get so sentimental. I think Eric, like well, Eric leaving that show was like it was such a a big like that last scene with Dr. Tom with Michael. Oh my god! It was just like it was so epic that I actually learned from my hair from uh, Vincent and Christine, who were hair and makeup for the majority of the time with me, they just said, well, Aaron, we never say in film, we never say goodbye. We always say, we'll see you. So when we left being Erica, the whole crew, we all said, well, we'll see you. We'll see you. Yeah. Like it wasn't like a different- And the truth is you probably will. Yeah. Oh my God, Christine, every time we go to Toronto, we have our, we, go, we, have, we have like biscuits and tea. And, oh. and I, I still very much keep in touch with them and my old, my old driver, Gary Flanagan. Uh, See, but like, I know it's those people like they have a place in my heart for you know getting you through the days when you're not feeling great it's those folks like it's the hair and the makeup and the transport that are like hey you okay and I'm like oh you well, know family like she literally was like Christine is the one person on set more so than the producers or anything that would be like well Erin I think that we should do this and I would do it like she was like my she was like my mom mm. and but but so to get back to like navigating different parts I think that every job you get you have to look at your uh role on it is it reoccurring is it a guest star is it a lead um who are you working with and like read the room you know yeah. and um do you remember that day that you stepped into the power of that role of being erica stepped into the witch the power the power of like or did you just feel at home right away that show was so weird i just felt at home right away yeah it just felt, and I didn't, I have to be honest with you, I didn't think that my audition was anything amazing. Like, I, I remember they flew me into test for it, and I was reading with Michael Riley, and I did the audition, and I did it the best, but I, it wasn't one of those ones where, you know, you leave. Very few, very few for me, but every now and then I walk out, and I was like, I knocked that out of the park. You just know. But I remember with that show, I was like, I just, but I just think inherently I was, that very much that character. They couldn't yeah. find her for a very long time. They're like, we need someone that is a huge loser. That is <laughs> somebody <laughs> who played the biggest loser. And then I rolled in and I was like, what up? And they're like, oh, it's her. Yeah. So yeah, so they say that they, uh, who's I talking? Oh, I was talking to um, Sydney Poitier. Do you know her? She, she's Sydney Poitier's daughter, Sydney Poitier. Okay, I was going to say. I know. But well, that's, anyway, she was, she's going to be on this podcast and she was talking about how a lot of, give her a call. Oh my God. Yeah. She's amazing. And she was talking about how a lot of directors want you just to be the person. They don't want you to like drop into anything. They just want you to be a person that they're going to hire and cast as that character. But then mm -hmm. she worked with um, Tarantino and it was different. He said like she, he really enjoyed watching her become the person. So it depends on the, but as you said, like, I think, I, I do think that you slipped into the being Erica shoes as if it was your own. It was, very, it was entirely seamless. And that, that, there was a lot of like interesting things in that show that was like kismet, that was happy accidents. Michael Riley calls it lightning in a bottle. Um, I, when we shot the pilot, it was, it was nine days and Holly Dale was the director of it. She's wonderful, like wonderful. She really pushed me. Um, and we both thought it was a comedy. Like I read this as it being like somewhat of a dark comedy. She thought it was a comedy. And then the pilot got tested. Fred Fuchs was the head of uh, drama at CBC at the time. And he's like, you know, it's the weirdest thing. We were at the cast party or whatever the opening, but going into shooting season one. And he's like, it's the weirdest thing. It tested as a comedy. And Holly and I kind of looked at each other like, isn't it a, isn't it a comedy? <laughs> I guess they were going for a full blown drama. 
And then they hired like a ding dong like me. And I'm like, let's make it funny. Yeah. And so it kind of went from there. And, and Jana Senior, who's our, she's the brain proud of the whole thing. I remember her with writers. She said, you can never write. Erica will never, ever tell a joke. Never write a joke. Like Erica, because Aaron will already like ham bone the shit out of it. <laughs> and keep writing the drama. And then they were really awesome about just like, after we did the pilot, season even going into the end of season one there was only an on-set producer we never had people breathing down our throats i did all my adr sessions alone uh it was only ever you know who's ever guest guest directing and an on-set producer navigating uh or relaying information from cbc jan and aaron temple street notes to them but like i never got notes i never they just let me kind of go and play and if I'd go off book, like like paraphrasing, doing my own weird thing, then the director would be like, great, we got that. Now let's just do one as it's <laughs> the <written>. actual script. <laughs> we just focus on the actual script. And, uh, but, but the majority of the time, I was just like free to run and roam. And it was so wonderful. I, I love it when no one's breathing down your neck. But I also, every now and then, I've been on shows where it's like really Adam McDonald and Slasher, man, he pushed me and directed me and made me pivot a million different directions it was exhausting i wasn't used to it i was i put up like resistance to it at first i had to really go through trust things with him and like relinquish control as an artist which i just hadn't been used to doing and it was a really cool process so not to ramble but like at, at absolutely every show is so different but erica was one of those ones that was like glass slippers I slipped into them and then we danced for her four seasons. I mean, it just feels like you have this, I've always thought this about you, that you have such a grounding and self-confidence slash awareness that, that I, I, I never, I've never seen you off kilter. Like, I mean, in the set or like hanging out with you, what's the thing that puts you off kilter? Not that scares you, but that just takes your, takes your breath away a bit. Professionally or personally? Sure, well, both. Yeah, I'll say yeah. both. Okay, because professionally, I'm pretty good at keeping my shit together. Personally, God. Um, <laughs> I find a hard time, like, dividing the two, like, because I take everything so personally. I don't anymore. Oh. I oh, really don't. Tell me a tale. I'm like, I mean, not that I'm enlightened or whatever. And yeah, things are going to hurt, but I've kind of, I don't know if it's like, are you in your 40s yet? Not to Yeah, speak. adorable. Yeah. I feel, because I feel like in my 40s, I just, there, there's that thing where it's like, I don't really care. Like in romantic relationships, I stopped trying to be something that I'm right. not. In friendships, I've really whittled down the people that are super important in my life because the people that really love me, they, they, this the whole like warts and all thing. What puts me off kilter professionally is, um, what puts me off kilter professionally? Um, look at you got my little hamsters really working away here i mean maybe it's nothing gosh i mean that's amazing i mean there's there's obviously little things i mean I'm, I'm gonna get nervous and am i doing the right thing i i i i don't love power tripping on um on sets by any stretch and i think that the the the, the only bad times i can remember filming are where i butted heads and it's usually with a male ad um i that's i've had two instances what do you, how do you deal with that kind of stuff well one that, that kind of stuff takes it takes me so off guard that i'm like uh, and then later i'm like that is so not right like i'd love to be able to go back and be like remember what you said three days ago but i'm so taken aback when things like that happen how do you deal with it uh so the two instances the first one was in my 20s and it's it's just kind of at the time being so doe-eyed and not wanting to make a fuss and wanting to just, you know, he was, it was, it was almost borderline me too-y and he mm -hmm. was an awful, awful, awful person. He called me baby tomato. He scheduled things so that I missed a call back for Kingdom Hospital in Vancouver. He tore a strip off me in front of the entire transportation team saying that I left set early. I was working with Kirstie Alley and, and I would never, ever, like, I'm so scared of getting in trouble. And particularly in my 20s, I was, like, right there, ready to go. And they wrapped us. And he, he accused me of, like, leaving set and blah, 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 which was all not true. Like, all the actors there were like, what? It got back to um, 
casting in Vancouver. Anyways, he was just like a brutal guy. And I took it so personally and I felt awful. And then I remember Ty Runyon, who's this amazing actor. He was like, this isn't right. And uh, he brought a beer down to my hotel room and we had a beer and he's like, are you okay? And I was bawling and I was like, oh, because I thought I did something wrong. And then actually over the course of the night, I was like, this isn't right. He's super power trippy, whatever. And the next day I just, I said, uh, you know, David, I'd like to speak with you. And I said, I don't appreciate the tone that you used with me yesterday. I've never walked off set. And if there's a problem with that, that is your department. And he was just a diabolical dickhead and said, you know what, sweetheart? Oh, it's not my, it's not my fault. And you know what? You're not going to make that little call back. Isn't that bad? Yeah. We had to schedule in whatever. Oh my. Oh, it was brutal. Brutsky. And then, uh, yeah, even in front of the director, he said something. And the director's like, Oh, you're able to make that call back. That's wonderful. And like, I was like, uh, what? Like he was just really nasty. Yeah. And, um, and then I did a television series called Godiva's. It was my first lead. It was an ensemble cast, but, uh, and the, I remember the PM, Gigi said, you know, Aaron, if there's anything we can do to make this better for you or comfortable, just let me know. And I just remember saying to her, well, if I can be honest, there's one, a, there's one AD out, assistant director in Vancouver that I don't ever want working with our actors. And his name is, you know, David Blah. And she said, you've got to be kidding. We have a, we have a, a, an interview. He has an interview tomorrow. And then she just looked at me and she's like, well, not anymore. So, bah, it all comes around. But I think at the time- But you don't want to work with that. Like, that's not you being mean. That's you going, I can't have somebody like that on my team. Yeah, and having, and like knowing your boundaries. And I tell you now, like, that's when I was in my 20s. Now in my 40s, like, if I'm not comfortable with something, and it's very stressful as a, as an actor if it comes to nudity or, mm-hmm. or like, I had this really weird death scene where- like my safety was somewhat compromised in it. And like, and, and at this point, like throughout the years, if you have 50 people staring at you and they're like, just take off your shirt, just take off your shirt, just do this. You said you would, da, 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 da. It's, it's one second of being like, ah, pressure to do it. It's forever on camera. Yeah. So I, but it's I, forever like in your heart too. Like when I don't stand up for myself, that's like, I, or, for, or if I see something that I don't stand up for, I'm like, oh, sneakers, you can do yeah. better. Yeah. Whether it's for myself or for something that is in my periphery, you know? A thousand percent. Yeah. And that, that's just something I think with time that I actually, I don't give a fuck what people think. Like they, there were supposed to be closed sets and some love scenes in the show that I was shooting and I got there and they had the advertisers in there, the product <laughs> people from, come Tet- on, from Tetley T watching my friend's love scene. And they're like, Oh, Aaron, come and look at the shot. It's really beautiful. And, and so there I am watching my, really good friend doing this intimate thing with my other friend because we all work together and there's a bunch of Tetley T people just like wanking behind the monitor watching this and I was like excuse me guys yeah this is a closed set anyone the only people that should be here and I said it to our producer so that I wasn't the one like oh my god you know I just said to the producer I'm like this needs to be a closed set right now you got about five minutes to get it so that there's just an AD here and the director and you and hair and makeup that are required get everyone the fuck out or I'm calling you and in a nice way. And it was done. And that's just, so like standing up for yourself and it's not always easy. You feel a lot of pressure. Um, Don't you feel better? Like it makes me, it makes me shaky, sweaty, and a little bit teary (laughs) whenever I stand. Like, but it also defines, I don't know. Like I just had an instant. I had to stand up for myself and I woke up every morning until it was dealt with, with this thought in my head. I got to deal with that. I got to deal with it. I finally dealt with it. And I'm like, that's that's my story I want that to be my story when I stand up for myself I don't want to be the story of like oh my gosh she was so easy going that anything could happen I want to be the story that she knew what she believed in and she pushed it through that's so beautiful it's hard to get it's not easy I'm not saying that it's easy and I'm not saying it's a day it's not a day-to-day struggle it is like I mean we don't see anybody anymore because we're in quarantine but like when you see stuff that you're like that's not right I got into like like a physical fight at a sushi place on Vermont. What? Yeah, like there was a fight going on. And my instinct is to like, you break that up. The guy was like punching him in the head. I'm like, like he was drunk. And I was like, that's just not right. So I threw my chair into it. And then my friend was like, get out of there. And then later on, I'm like, he could have had a gun. That was probably really stupid. But I like myself a lot more when I take action on things I don't believe in. I think your instinct's right. I love that. I love that. I would have done the exact same thing. Right? You like something. 
in work, I'm very good. And there's also a way of like going into a conflict situation and really trying to make the, take the emotion out of it. Yeah. And the confidence behind it and people will listen. And so professional. What's your strategy with that? What you just said, taking the emotion out of it. It's so much easier for me to do professionally than personally. Because personally, if there's a conflict to take the emotion out, I'm like, oh, for God's sakes. And to also have confidence and trust yourself in what you're doing. Like you've made a decision and you're standing up for yourself. I have to wrap it up. And I hate wrapping it up because I could talk to you for another six hours. But I have two final questions. One of them is, what is the best mistake you've ever made? Oh, <laughs> Wow. I think the best mistake I've made is in romantic relationships, not giving myself credit and putting other people on a pedestal and having like an, uh, idealizing people in romance mm-hmm. and going into a relationship and being like, how can you match me? How can we be together? And to not give up all of my goods for something that isn't deserving of it. That's the best mistake I've made. And a, a new lesson at 41. Uh, it's, but it's very strong right now and it feels good. Let's hope that we can learn when we're 71, 80. Uh, oh, I don't hope. Know. Yeah. And we'll never stop. We'll never, as long as we're open to it. Yeah. That's the part, right? Okay. The other question I have for you is what advice would you, uh, would you have given your younger self? I think I simply would say to myself, my like little younger self, I'd be, I'd just say, trust yourself. Yeah. Sounded like you did. Sounded like you believed pretty strongly in your vision and your goals. Professionally, for sure. (laughs) (laughs) I have a hot mess on, but yeah. Yeah. I just think, I just think the world of you. I just have always thought this and I am so happy to have this time with you. I wish we could have coffee and hug afterwards and I hope we will. Yeah. But I'm always game to hang out with you. I think you're such a cool, smart, funny person. And uh, I mean, I'm curious what you're going to do next. Like you're, you're going to act, you're going to act. I know you've done a little bit of producing stuff. Mm-hmm. What else is on your plate that you're like, I got to get into this now? I would, I would love to direct. Just because. I mean, that's your jam, Erin. Like seriously, would- listen how you're talking about specifics and about looking after your crew. That's your jam. It's family. That's really where I, and I, and I, and I love, really love working with like actors. I love that environment and I'd love to be behind the monitor because being in front of the monitor, I have such a, in front of the camera, I have such like a intimate relationship with it. And I love that vibe, but I get, I get kind of now like looking behind the curtain and as my other friends are starting to direct and be like, what, what is that? Being behind the monitor and, and telling the story from a much bigger perspective like as a director not just playing my little piece of it mm-hmm. I think so exciting do you have a story that you want to tell as a director I have here's the one thing I could I, I feel like given my uh experience that directing obviously there's a lot of new things that I would learn but I, I have I feel more comfortable within that the writing stuff like I've been I'm one of those people that's like yeah I'm gonna write a script I sit down my head flops over on the thing I do laundry, I taxes, tax, I'll do anything other than put a line on the page. So I, I just really, I, that is not my jam. What do I want to write? I, I would love it if someone gave me a really awesome, amazing script that I just jived with. Um, but maybe like, not even when I ask you like, what, what story do you want to tell? But like, what story would you like to direct? Whether or not you're writing it is unnecessary, unnecessary to answer, but. Do you know that I would love to do a story about, um, a woman our age uh dealing with sobriety it's just such like a it's um Mm. it's just a theme that is always going to be relevant to talk about Mm -hmm. and sometimes it's you know the last one that I can really think about is when a man loves a woman with Meg Ryan Mm -hmm. back but I just want to make something that's very timely right now with this whole sober curious um movement that we're going through just something relevant that people can watch and be like oh I mean everybody deals with that are you do you deal with that kind of stuff too I do yeah I haven't had a drink for uh over a half a year now I started doing a cleanse and I'm just like this is amazing (laughs) I feel clear and I feel and it's just yeah it just it's it's such a huge impact on society and there's so many stories out there still that just romanticize alcohol that I would like to see one 
that romanticizes life by getting rid of the alcohol in it. Mm, I love that. Yeah. I mean, I hate writing too, but I'll write it for you this afternoon. Done. Done. (laughs) I'll direct it. You can start writing it. There we go. Yeah. I think that's a great vision of a story though. You're right. It's a, yeah. There's, and they're so relatable. Gosh, especially right now with everybody, cocktail hours coming earlier and earlier. But I do like when I say to people like, well, let's, let's sit down and have a cup of coffee or a glass of wine. Like I'm always very aware that not everybody's a drinker and not to put everybody into that place and not to push alcohol on anybody. And it's a good awareness. I just find California, it's so chill. Like people are like, great. You yeah. do or you don't. Like all my friends are like, you're not drinking right now? Wonderful. Great. Half of yeah. them aren't. It's just kind of, yeah, it is still kind of taboo. Some places like you're not drinking. What's I know. Wrong? And you're like, no. well, you're putting poison in your body. So what the fuck is wrong with you? Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I never to be on a soapbox telling people they can't drink. And I mean, I don't know. It's not to say that I'll never have a glass of champagne again, but I just, yeah, it's just, yeah. Life for me has gotten a lot clearer Yeah. since I haven't. Anyways, that's a whole other, whole other podcast. I love it. I think you're the best. I'm such a fan. Thank you so much for this time. Thank you for having me on and I love you to bits. So, so great to catch up with this firecracker. I just, I really, I really adore her. Uh, We haven't seen each other, gosh, for a long time. We used to do a show here in Los Angeles, a live uh, improv show, my husband and I, and she would come at almost every show and support isn't that amazing she's just a just a gem she's a gem i'll take any version of seeing her face even if it has to be virtual right now now you can follow aaron at aaron carplock on social media and then of course while you're over there easy peasy follow firecracker d-e-p-t we're talking about this episode on an upcoming after show that comes out on thursday so make sure you're subscribed to our youtube channel as well and then let us know what you thought we hope that you're staying safe out there And we hope that you're finding ways of connecting to your community. It's really tricky, but make sure you reach out if you need us. There's a whole firecracker community here for you, and we're your people. So reach on out. And as I say, there's always a chair at the firecracker table for you. So pull it up. There is something for everyone within the firecracker department. And if you're not already part of our firecracker members group over on Facebook, why not? You should be, it's super fun. This is where you'll hear about what's going on in all the departments and also meet some fabulous firecracker people from all over the world. So get in on that action. There's a department and a seat for everyone at the firecracker table, cause really we've been waiting for you. So come on in and join the community. Big, huge, massive, gigantic, big hearted thank you to the whole firecracker team. Oh my gosh, everyone who are in Los Angeles, Toronto, Vancouver, and all the way over in the UK. And we've got some firecrackers that are humming over in New York or hoping to start a chapter over there as well. Thank you to the core members that really make everything work. They're incredible, incredible people. Remember the after show for this episode comes out on Thursday and you'll be able to meet a couple of the core members through that. And then we're gonna do a whole new episode on Tuesdays. Yeah, we don't stop. Because we know that this stuff is important. It gives folks platforms for your voices, for your stories. And thanks to you for taking the time to listen. Because you know what? There's a lot of options out there. And there's a lot of information. So we're really thrilled that you chose us. Let us know what you're working on. Let us know how we can help. So go on out there. Go out and get creative. Take some creative action. And then let us know what you're doing. Let us know how we can help you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening. I'm Naomi, and we'll see you next time on the Firecracker Department.